Dave, I wish that my voice was a little deeper this morning so that maybe I could have the gravitas as I read scripture as you did this morning. <laughs> it was a little extra bass in there. He was explaining it to me this morning. It, it, it added a nice depth. But I am my slightly higher voice will be looking at the Gospel of Mark and reading that same story we just referred to a moment ago when Jesus calls the disciples, the first four disciples. We will be at verse 14 through verse 20. So let us listen to the word of the Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we pray that you would continue to be with us as we ponder your words to us. We pray that you would silence any voice in us but your own, that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word. And Lord, I pray that as my words stray from yours, may they fall away and quickly be forgotten, but may your word, your truth, and your promise remain upon our hearts forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, as I consider with you the story of these four disciples being called away from their duties as fishermen to follow Jesus, I think back to my growing understanding of this passage, because maybe like you, I grew up hearing this in Sunday school and in church, and I heard the story and thinking, that's a wonderful story, and that phrase being fishers of men or fishers of people resonates, has a good ring to it. But you have to admit, when you become an adult and the weight and the impact of your job and a mortgage and a family to feed, that starts to add a little extra weight to the passage, does it not? Adds a depth to the sacrifice these fishermen were making when they merely gave up their nets to follow Jesus. There's a whole lot more going on in this passage than the shortest job interview ever. We were talking about that at the 8 a.m. service. Jesus says, follow me. They say, okay, let's go. That's a quick job interview. I know in the Presbyterian church it doesn't happen that quick. <laughs> Yet, Simon and Andrew, James and John, all answer this call from Jesus. And they walk away from life as they know it. They walk away from all of their responsibilities. They walk away from their jobs, their security, their safe comfort. You see, they were bred to be fishermen. This wasn't something they happened upon. They were bred to be fishermen. They were under the tutelage of their fathers who were learned from their fathers, who learned from their fathers. This was their lot in life. So everything they knew was about this. And yet, they leave it all behind to follow this crazy itinerant preacher who stands on the shoreline calling them to follow. This exciting and dangerous journey that would change the course of history. But of course, they didn't know that at the time. But they answered a call. There's a certain humor in the fact that this story and the story of Jonah have been placed side by side in the lectionary this morning. 
because the contrast between these two different calls is pretty stark. The portion of Jonah that we read is actually the second call Jonah receives to go to Nineveh. And if you spent any time in Sunday school growing up, you would know what happened when he received the first call. It's a crazy story. Immediately prior to this particular call, the second call was the first to go to Nineveh. And he runs and jumps on a ship and heads in a different direction. That would be as if, let's say, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, when Jesus said, come, I will make you fishers of people, and they jumped in their boats and immediately rowed to the other side. It's a humorous image, isn't it? But that's pretty much exactly what Jonah does. He jumps into a boat and decides, I am going to run from God because this thing that you have asked me to do is reprehensible. I won't do it. Nineveh. You want me to go to Nineveh, God? Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, the same empire that had taken over, destroyed Israel, and occupied their land. And Jonah can't imagine taking the message of God to the very people he likely hates the most, so he runs. Do you think running from God is a wise choice? No, probably not. In fact, Jonah has been used as an example on many occasions of the consequences of running to God, scaring school children for many, many years of the ocean. The story gets real interesting once Jonah embarks on that ship, and the ship hits rough weather. It gets so bad they begin to throw cargo overboard to lighten the load so that they can try to make it back to shore, but no matter what they do, they can't make it back to the shore. It doesn't matter what they try. And so they're all so frustrated and so scared, they begin to pray that they are different gods. And they cast lots of who has made their God angry that we can't make it back to shore because there's some sort of divine intervention going on here. And so the lots are cast, and guess who the lots point toward? Jonah. And Jonah, in a true moment of honesty, comes clean and says, yes, I'm running from my God, the one true God. And if you throw me overboard, the seas will calm. And so after a little more prodding, they weren't so quick to throw him overboard. They concede and they throw him overboard. And what would normally mark the end of a tragic story for many is not the end of this story because the Lord still has a job to do. And Jonah is swallowed up by an enormous fish. This is the part we like to remember. The enormous fish swallows him up, and again, what would mark the end for most of us is not the end for Jonah, because the Lord still has a job to do. And it's while sitting in the belly of the fish that Jonah begins to reconsider his plans, and he prays, and he sings to God. Writer and poet Aldous Huxley imagines the scene in this way. He says, Seated upon the convex mound of one vast kidney, Jonah prays, and sings his canticles and hymns, making the hollow vault resound God's goodness in mysterious ways till the great fish spouts music as he swims. It's an interesting image, Jonah resting on the kidney, praying to God for deliverance. And God does indeed hear Jonah and instructs this great fish to deposit Jonah on dry land and ironically enough, close to the very city he was supposed to go. And Jonah, still covered in fish vomit and waterlogged, ventures into enemy territory to share the word of God with the very people he dislikes the most. And then he shares probably the shortest sermon that any evangelist has ever shared. In 40 days, the Lord will overcome you along those words. Not particularly inspiring, but you know what? 
they turn to God. The entire city of Nineveh turns to God. Catherine Shepherdecker, who is an Old Testament professor at Luther Seminary, says this. Here's the thing, you see. Here's the thing all of us have found out about following the call of God in and through the waters. God is God and does not act as we think the Almighty should act. In good faith, we follow where we hear God's call. We go to the city or the suburb or the small town or rural America, and we are prepared to bring God's word to that place and, we find is that, and what we find is that God is already there before us. We find that no people, no place, not even Nineveh, can properly be called God-forsaken. No people, no place, not even Nineveh, can be properly called God-forsaken. This morning, we hear two distinct, different stories of call. The biggest difference in these two different stories is the reaction of those called. Four fishermen drop their nets and follow. In the other, one jumps aboard a ship and winds up in a fish before he follows. These tales seem to beg the question, how do we answer the call of God? Certainly you have never run from God, have you? What ways do we run from God? What are the excuses that we have? Busy schedules? Perhaps, God, there's somebody else that's better suited for this than me. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. We may not find our escape upon a ship, but we certainly do have our ways of running. Our escape is found in our excuses of overburdened schedules, worries of safety and security, and hidden within the line items of our budgets. Our running may seem a little more subdued, but it's ridiculous nonetheless. Who indeed can run from God? For beyond the differences of these stories this morning is a common thread. And that common thread is a call. A call from God. When God calls, God calls with a purpose. God has a particular purpose in mind for Jonah. God has a particular purpose in mind for Simon Peter, for Andrew, for James, and for John. When God calls... God calls with a purpose. And the purpose of each call was to follow and share the good news of God so that others might know God. So that others might know God. When Jonah finally follows his call, a miraculous thing happens. Nineveh, of all places, turns to God. Much to Jonah's chagrin, if you read the rest of the passage, you realize that Jonah is not quite excited about the success of his short evangelistic sermon and that the whole city that he hates has turned to God and so he sits down and God protects him even though he sits in misery. But when we consider the disciples, we stand as living proof to the effect of their answered call. We worship the one true God here this morning because somewhere along the way, somebody shared the life-giving message of Jesus. Somebody helped us to know God. We all can be reluctant messengers, but we would do well to remember that God does not call us to meaningless work. Sometimes it may seem tedious. Anybody who has ever sat on a committee or sat on session, knows that there can be quite tedious work. And it's not always convenient. It wasn't convenient for our elders to take a weekend to come and spend away from their duties at home to be with the pastors and staff of the church and other elders to vision. Yet, they did. We are not called to meaningless work. We are all called to a purpose. 
so that others might know God. Friends, it's not a matter of when God calls us, will you answer. It's a matter that God has already called you, will you answer. Because the world is so ready to hear about a God who loves them, about a God who would go to great lengths to be with them, about a hope in the midst of darkness, about a life eternal. This is the message our world needs to hear, especially today. Will we answer when God calls? Amen.